Starting today and for the rest of this week, we'll be bringing you a series of four reports from Singapore on the city-state's water and garbage management. On the small and crowded main island, Singapore has to come up with some imaginative ways to use its limited resources in sustainable ways. In the first of our series, we'll look at the country's efforts to collect and recycle its precious water. Currently, Singapore has an agreement with Malaysia to supply it with water, but the link has been a source of conflict between the two countries, so Singapore is aiming to make its water system self-sufficient. Singapore, a tiny city-state with a population of nearly five million people, devotes two-thirds of its overcrowded land to water harvesting. In the Southeast Asian country, afternoon showers are commonplace. The problem is not a shortage of rainfall, but a lack of space to capture it. So these harvesting pools gather every drop that falls on Singapore. However, water harvesting can only satisfy 20% of the city-state's needs, which is why Singapore has signed deals with neighbouring Malaysia to supply it with water. The first agreement expires in 2011 and a second will run out in 2061. Tapping into the more stable source of the ocean that surrounds its islands, Singapore also has a desalination plant. Apart from water harvesting, Importing and desalination, Singapore has developed a high-tech reclamation program that can turn sewage into drinkable new water. The system takes household and factory wastewater through underground drains to a treatment plant from where some of the treated water is expelled into the sea while the rest is taken to a reclamation facility to go through a three-stage process. The first stage is microfiltration, thin strands that look like noodles but are 1,000 times thinner than human hair take out suspended particles, bacteria and larger solids. The second stage is reverse osmosis in which the water passes through layers of semi-permeable membranes that block anything bigger than water molecules. The result is good enough to drink, but to guarantee its quality, there's a final stage of UV disinfection, which zaps any remaining organisms. After going through the three main processes, the pH level of this water will be a little low and acidic, so we add some sodium hydroxide to make it more alkaline. After restoring its pH balance, we pipe the water directly to our reservoirs or to our industrial zones. The washing machines at this laundry use new water. The price is 52 cents cheaper than tap water, and the manager says the quality is better too. Is it more soft? Yeah, it's compared to the quality of the normal tap water. This one is better. Oh, okay. It won't uh, hurt your. Clothes. No, no, nothing will happen to the clothes. Currently, Singapore gets 30 percent of its water from reclamation, 20 percent from water harvesting and 10% from desalination. At 40%, most still comes from imports. But Singapore aims to produce enough new water to satisfy half its needs by 2060, the year before the next new agreement with Malaysia comes to an end. Forced by circumstances to develop reclamation technology, Singapore is hoping to reduce its dependence on imported water and use and reuse every available drop to its fullest potential. The small but wealthy city-state of Singapore has plenty of rainfall but lacks natural lakes and rivers to capture it. That's why the government has invested in man-made rain harvesting pools. Running out of space on land, Singapore is looking to the ocean to store up its drinking water. In the second of our series of installments from the industrious city-state, we introduce you to the marina barrage across the mouth of the marina channel, which holds back fresh water from the river and creates a man-made reservoir by the city waterfront. Keeping the collection pool clear of litter is a major task, and it took two years to flush the salt out of the estuary.
reservoirs are the modern source of water. You usually find them upstream, but in Singapore, there's one by the sea. The mouth of the marina channel in Singapore is blocked by a 320 metre barrage, separating the seawater from the reservoir and holding back fresh water that would otherwise flow into the ocean. At first, the trap water was still too salty to drink, which is where the dam came into play. During storms, the sluice gates are opened to release water behind the weir. Through a cycle of allowing rain to dilute the water and regularly releasing the overflow, the salt was gradually flushed out until the reservoir was ready to use in November of this year. On the right is seawater, and on the left there is clean fresh water. The rest of our here supplies us with one tenth of local needs. After two years of the natural flushing system, it is now a 100% freshwater lake. During a heavy shower, one of the crest gates is open to release excess stormwater and prevent flooding. The low-lying areas beside the marina used to be prone to flooding in high tides or torrential rain. But now giant pumps quickly drain the stormwater into the sea. As well as improving the flood problem, the barrier eliminates the effect of tides and keeps the basin water level constant, creating ideal conditions for recreational activities. But maintaining the pristine lake takes a lot of hard work from people behind the scenes. There are 16 government-owned boats alone that ply the reservoir picking up garbage. You see the kind of litter? Trash, plastic, foam, cup. Are these into recyclables? No. no right? When they do this, they will not sort it. All trash? All trash. Although everything is done by hand, the net only has to be dipped into the water to pull up a catch of garbage. A bigger boat and different machinery nets trash that has to be counted by the pile. Plastic bag, plastic bag, plastic bag. In the reservoir that supplies 10% of Singapore's drinking water, 100,000 tons of rubbish can be collected a day. Apart from government efforts, volunteers have also joined the clean-up campaign. Environment, no one authority is responsible. It's everybody. It's the same environment. We breathe on the same air. We drink the same water. So we must not take ownership. But this begs the question, where does the garbage come from? These waterfront steps are covered in litter, which will be swept into the reservoir when it rains. You see the dustbin so close to the water. So if you don't bag it properly, you just throw it fall down, you don't bother, you have a problem. The wind and the rain come, it will fall into the reservoir. Apart from scooping up litter, the volunteers also regularly check the water quality. We're measuring the clarity of the water. Zero is the cleanest, and this is over 11, which means you can see it with the naked eye. It's not clear, it's very cloudy. Volunteers also patrol the waterfront on bicycles, collecting litter as they ride. I'm not very happy. Why do they litter? There are bins over there. Why don't they use them? It's like they have a brain, but they don't use it. I feel sad that some people don't care enough to, to keep the river clean. And at the same time, I feel happy to be helping uh, our, our, this country uh, to keep the environment clean. Waterways Watch Society started with just 20 people, but now there are over 200 volunteers who devote their free time to cleaning up the reservoir and waterfront and help keep the water clean for everyone. Some people say Singapore is a litter-free country. What you probably didn't know is that the tiny country produces a whopping 7,000 tons of garbage a day. 
94% of which is vaporized in the incinerator, while the remaining 6% of ash is buried. However, the last landfill of the crowded main island was filled up in 1999. Since then, Singapore has been taking its trash out to the sea, to the world's first offshore landfill, on the small but ever-growing island of Sumaku. In the latest of our series of reports on sustainable development in Singapore, we went to investigate how the government is reducing the environmental impact of the landfill. Singapore is booming and its population is approaching 5 million people. The flip side of development is the 7,100 tons of rubbish it produces every day. The largest incinerator receives 3,000 tons a day, which it reduces to 700 tons of ash, 20% of the original mass and 10% of the volume. is then loaded onto ships and sailed to the largest offshore landfill in the world. The Sumacau landfill is surrounded by a four-mile-long barrier, creating a huge lagoon, which is further split into 11 sections. The seawater is then drained to make way for the ash. Before we use it, we seal the pipe and see how much water is left. Most of the time, we don't need to pump out too much. Then we start filling it. Stopping the waste contaminating the sea is the top priority, so every lagoon must be leak-proof. The most important part of the landfill is this bank, because on the bank we have an impermeable geomembrane and a layer of sea clay, which guarantees the waste material won't leak out. Wells dug beside the lagoons are checked once a month to test the water quality and make sure the ocean is not being polluted. This strip of mangroves also indicates changes in water quality. In the past 10 years, we have seen the mangroves flourish and grow, which means the sea around here isn't polluted. After a lagoon is topped off with soil, two or three years later, what was once a landfill is transformed. After the water area is filled in, we cover it with a layer of soil about 20 to 30 centimeters deep. After covering it with earth, the plants start growing naturally, and birds come. In a couple of years, it turns into a big pasture. This area is almost full. After it is full, we cover it with soil, which is the final stage of the landfill. The area the manager is talking about only took six months to fill. At this rate, the whole ocean area will be filled by the year 2045. With the deadline looming, Singapore is investing in ways to reduce the amount of waste that needs to be buried by incinerating all its garbage. The arriving ash does not smell or attract flies, evidenced by the wildlife you see on the island today. The offshore landfill of today used to be a tiny fishing village 11 years ago. Land reclamation and waste disposal expanded it into a huge offshore landfill. Although Singapore is keeping its promise to limit the environmental impact, for the organisms that used to live here undisturbed, the arrival of the landfill just like the huge Jurong oil refinery which is visible from Sumacau must be having an effect. Built on top of what used to be seven small islets, the vast offshore facility meets Singapore's current needs but could bring the city-states even greater problems in the future. 
Singapore is known for its strict laws against littering and its reputation for being the cleanest city in the world. But as we find out in the last of our in-depth reports from the country, public awareness of recycling garbage is very low. Of the 1,500 tons of leftover food that is thrown away every day, only around 10% is recycled. We went to a recycling plant to find out how leftovers are turned into biogas and fertilizer and asked why more food waste isn't treated the same. At this bustling food court in Singapore, you're bound to find something that agrees with you. But after eating your fill, the leftovers are mercilessly thrown into the bin. According to official figures, last year Singapore produced over 600,000 tonnes of food waste, of which only 13% was recycled. Some of it came here. The mountain of leftovers may look useless, but at this food waste recycling plant, it's turned into energy. Our company uses the electricity from here, and we sell the access to the power company, which goes to ordinary homes. One machine can produce enough energy for 4,000 homes, so our two machines can supply 8,000 homes. So how is rotting food turned into electricity? Putting on surgical masks for the first step, the workers pick out plastic bags and other litter that's mixed in with the leftovers. But hang on a minute. How does trash get into kitchen waste? Let's go back to that food court to find out. Aha! So the plastic packaging gets chucked into the bin with the leftover food. It comes in terms and terms of uh, <clears throat> uh, packagings. And when they want to throw away, it's actually tie into a plastic bag and throw into the bin. So it's, it's a normal habit. <laughs> but we cannot do away with plastic at the moment. But generally, is to try to segregate waste, uh, food waste away from any other waste. Back at the recycling plant, the sorted food waste is liquefied and sent to two large biogas containers. 21 days later, it produces methane that can power the electricity generator. We can see here the reading is show 530 kilowatt. The remains of the decomposed food waste also has a valuable use. This is the compost fertilizer. It's already organic compost and it's turned into soil. It has an earthy smell. This is its final use. It can be sold now to grow vegetables and fruit trees. From rotting leftover food to sweet-smelling plant feed. Unfortunately, only 10% of the 1,500 tons of food thrown away in Singapore each day is recycled. The rest is burned in the incinerator. The low recycling rate has a lot to do with the way Singaporeans dispose of their trash. Apartment buildings are fitted with handy garbage chutes, and some kitchens even have one under the sink. When it's full, I throw it out in a plastic bag. I don't recycle the bottles. Collected in the same place on the ground floor, the rubbish is picked up every day, not by the government, but by private waste disposal companies, who then sort it. Public awareness about recycling is very low. There are recycling bins outside every residential block, but they're either unused or misused as ordinary trash cans. Tossing everything in the same bin may be quick and convenient, but the companies cannot possibly sort and recycle all the arriving waste. Clearly, Singapore needs to educate its residents about the principles of refuse disposal, so a sustainable cycle of reusing the city-state's limited resources can be put into effect.